and welcome to Wellness Live. My name is Dr. Olivia Moses, and we are excited to have you join us here today, this December of 2022. I want to remind you that if you are watching us live, we want you to ask questions of our speaker. You can uh, comment in the comment or the chat box, and we will ask our speaker absolutely your questions and get some answers. Well, we have a very special presentation here for you today. And if you're like me um, or have someone in your life like me, that as the years go by, you look in the mirror a little differently and you're saying, what is going on? How is my face changing? And a lot of that has to do with skin and skin health and dermatology. And also with the onset of online information, whether it's social media or various websites, we're getting a lot of information about our skin and our skin health. There are numerous skincare lines that are from beauty uh, brands and also influencers and celebrities. It seems like everybody has a skincare line. What do we believe? What is true? What is not true? What is a waste of money? Where should we be spending our money? Do we need to be spending our money? There's so many questions when it comes to skin health. So we have a very special guest um, with us today. His name is is Dr. Harry Dow, and he is the chair of our dermatology department here at Loma Linda University Health, and he is the perfect person to talk about us, talk with us about our skin. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Dow. Thanks so much for having me, Dr. Moses, today. All right. Dr. Moses, should I share the slides? And... Yes, please go ahead and share your screen and okay. let's get started. Okay, so let me know if you can't see my slides, but it's a pleasure to be here today chatting with everyone. I know it's virtual and I can't see the audience, so I hope to make it a great next half hour to come. So in thinking about what to do to put these slides together, I just wanted to keep everything simple for this holiday season coming. So the holiday season is approaching and we're all in search of what we can do for a better, healthier us. You know, as a general medical dermatologist, I specialize in keeping my patient's skin in tip top shape. And I'm excited to share today um, tips on what to do and what not to do for your skin. So it's really confusing, the world in which we live. Common questions I get in my practice oftentimes include, number one, are expensive products better? Do the foods I eat really matter? And what can I do now for healthier skin? And so while the science and data behind much of the answers to these questions are well beyond the scope of this brief talk, I wanted to cover the basics, um, the basic knowledge and principles that can serve us really well in the new year to come. And so if only youthful skin could be achieved with that one right cream or that one procedure, my talk would be over in just one or two slides. But to keep things simple today, it's a complex topic, but I wanted to talk about the three P's of healthy skin that we'll cover today. Number one, prevention. Prevention of skin damage from UV radiation, ultraviolet um, radiation, and other factors. This has to be done daily to set yourself up for success. Um, the second one is planning, planning healthy nutritional habits. Um, you know, no one supplements or food will ever be as good as a well-balanced nutritious diet. And so the skin as the largest organ in our body, it's in constant need of good nutrition. Third, performing. It's important to figure out the right skincare regimen for yourself by selecting the right products and the right procedures. And this is best done with the right team um, in concert with you. And so first to understand why is the prevention of skin damage so important, we'll talk about intrinsic factors, for example, the natural aging process, as well as extrinsic factors such as UV exposure and smoking that will affect um, the health of your skin. So first, the intrinsic factors, whether or not we want the natural aging process to happen, the skin will certainly undergo changes over time. It loses its elasticity and it becomes finely wrinkled and benign growths can appear. Overall, the skin is weaker and more prone to tearing and bruising. And so weaker skin can't lock in moisture as well. And one of the most common things I see in clinic, dry skin related problems such as eczema with its associated itching and pain, 
Um, it's just a common complaint I get. So the photo on the right, that's actually my own hand after a long week at work. You know, professions with lots of wet work. Um, I know lots of folks tuning in um, may work, be working in the healthcare industry or working in the restaurant industry, but industries with lots of wet work are especially prone to this type of dermatitis. And you know, some tips here, decreasing wet dry cycles can help. Frequent use of emollients can protect the skin barrier. Ointments in general cause less stinging than creams and lotions. So if you haven't tried something a little bit thicker as a vehicle to lock in the moisture, that's something to consider trying. But sometimes further evaluation is needed just to see if there's any other issues going on, such as allergic contact dermatitis that can prevent the full healing process. And so a little bit about extrinsic changes. These changes accelerate the skin aging process. And so two major factors are ultraviolet, um, ultraviolet uh, radiation as well as smoking. They both increase something called metalloproteinases. And this ultimately leads to weaker skin via the degradation of the skin's supporting structures. And of note, they both have carcinogenic potential. And so over time, these dark brown spots and sometimes lighter colored spots can appear on the skin. And the important thing to do is to make sure that there are no concerns for skin cancer present, most importantly. And so one interesting fact here, how can you control for genetics to better study the effects of environmental exposures on the skin? And so one interesting life experience I had, I had the chance to attend this annual Twins Day Festival in Twinsburg, Ohio, highlighted here during my residency training. This festival is actually the largest gathering of twins, and this includes triplets and quadruplets in the world. And so here you can see a picture of the twins that I met during the day. And um, it's, it's an amazing uh, uh, process to be a part of. You know, everyone you're meeting, you're wondering, where's your twin? And where's, where's your twin at the end of the day? And so it's an amazing uh, uh, event if you ever had a chance to travel up to the Midwest. And so what do you think actually happens when such a gathering occurs? You guess that academic centers from all around flock in to do more research. And so this is actually a series of photos taken from the Twins Day Festival, presenting twins around the age of 61. So twin B on the right here had about 10 hours per week greater sun exposure than twin A on the left. And the perceived age difference was about 11 years. Twin B on the right with more sun exposure had more solar lentigines or sunspots, as well as wrinkling of the skin. And so what should we do knowing all this data? All is not lost. There are things you can do now to slow down the skin aging process. Daily photo protection, as simple as it sounds, with broad spectrum sunscreen with an SPF factor of 30 or more is the usual advice. If you're engaging in water sports or anticipating lots of sweat inducing activity, sunscreens with water resistance are helpful. Um, sunscreen recommendations don't really exist of note for children less than the age of six months for fear of insufficient sunscreen use by parents leading to sunburns when parents have a false sense of security, for example, after sunscreen application. And so another common question I get is, what is sun protection factor or SPF? SPF measures the effectiveness of sunscreen against UVB rays. So for example, SPF 30 sunscreens extend the time needed by 30 fold before your skin will turn red from sun exposure. So there are diminishing returns, interestingly, when the SPF level increases. So F SPF 20 blocks about 95% of redness producing radiation and increasing it to SPF 40 blocks 97.5% of redness producing radiation. And so it's tricky out there when you see sunscreens with SPF 75 and SPF 100 values out there, it's blocking a little bit more of the UV radiation, but not a huge amount more. The most important issue though, is that oftentimes only 25 to 50% of the necessary amount of sunscreen is applied. And that's the big issue here. And so that's why I wanted to share this table on the left. Each row that you see here of body regions accounts for about 9% of your body surface area. And so rule of thumb here, if you apply a strip of sunscreen covering the index and middle finger from the fingertip to your palmar crease to each of these body regions, then you're setting yourself up for success. And if you were wondering, 
this hand belongs to my five-year-old daughter. So I got her to help me in preparing these slides by taking this photo. And so some myths that I wanted to cover, some protection myths. Myth number one, being in a car or being indoors protects you entirely from, from UV exposure. Actually, UVA can penetrate window glass as well as car side windows. And so someone sitting indoors all day doing work next to the window will actually accrue some UV exposure. And there are special films that can be purchased to block UV radiation if desired. Another myth is that sunscreen is unnecessary on a cloudy day. And actually cloudy days are due to a decrease in visible light, but over 90% of UV radiation still passes through the clouds. Lastly, one myth is that darker skin types don't have to worry about skin cancer. So if someone has darker skin, you know, there's this false impression out there that they can't get skin cancer, but you know, day in and day out in our dermatology clinic, we prove that myth is incorrect. Something about protective clothes. Sunscreens wear out um, with sun exposure, sunscreens that you put on your skin, they will wear out. But for the protective clothes are one of my favorite recommendations but not all clothes are made equal. A white t-shirt gives just a UPF factor protection level of seven on average. And so UPF measures the effectiveness of sun protection clothing against both UVA and UVB rays. And so clothes rated with a UPF 50 level protection blocks about 98% of UV exposure. And so that's one of my favorite recommendations um, to share. So what not to do, of course, tanning salon use uh, markedly increases the risk of skin cancer. So if wanting, if you're wanting that tanned look, um, self-tanners can offer that same type of tanned look without that UV um, induced skin damage. But remember, the self-tanners don't really offer much UV protection at all. Maybe at most an SPF level four protection, and that protection pretty much wears off um, hours after application. And so I had a chance to work with a team interested in the experiences and attitudes of prior beauty pageant contestants towards tanning. And we had this 20 question survey that was administered to about 50 current or prior beauty pageant contestants in this IRB approved study. And so some interesting findings to point out, society plays a big role in the attitudes and responses to how we perceive our skin. About 80% of our survey participants received initial exposure to tanning from previous pageant queens, social media, tanning sponsors, pageant coaches, um, so on and so forth. And so some open-ended responses from our survey um, reported that the tanned appearance made contestants feel, quote unquote, less washed out in appearance from the stage lights. Um, they felt feeling more toned than and um, healthy appearing as well. And so there's a lot of uh, attitudes that our society will um, kind of influence our habits. Um, so that's important to uh, take into account. So what to do, self-skin exams, um, they can help in the earlier detection of skin cancer. And so although melanoma only accounts for about 1% of skin cancers, it's responsible for most deaths related to skin cancer. So the ABCDEs I wanted to highlight on the right-hand side here, and the most important of which is the E, evolution. Is a pigmented lesion changing? Is it biologically active and should it be checked? And so if any lesion is persistently symptomatic, changing, changing in colors or changing in size or borders, it's important to bring it to your care team's attention so that you can get it assessed. Now, more commonly, there are non-melanoma skin cancers such as basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. And so the important thing here is when skin lesions don't heal the way that they should, for example, pimples that don't resolve or eczema that just keeps on getting bigger um, and not improving with treatments or lesions that are just causing pain, itch or bleeding, it's important to get these lesions uh, evaluated sooner rather than later. And so I think that concludes the first part of the talk here. I'll stop the sharing. Well, thank you, Dr. Dow. That is very useful information. And I think it's really important um, what you mentioned there, which I don't think a lot of people realize. It doesn't matter what the weather looks like outside. Uh, sunscreen is important. Now, on that topic of sunscreen, there's a number of different sunscreens out there. And you talked about SPH of 30 or above. What about the idea of the mineral versus, you know, I don't know, is it chemical? And then mm -hmm. 
also the sprays versus the sticks versus the lotions. Could you um, maybe speak to that? Yeah, so I'll try to keep it simple here, but my all time favorite type of sunscreens are the physical blockers. They are the zinc or titanium based sunscreens. So if you're looking for the active ingredients, you're looking for zinc and titanium or titanium. They're just, you know, the, remember from chemistry class, the molecules from the periodic table of the elements. So you have zinc, you have titanium. They're bigger molecules that block the sun's rays. And so they're bigger molecules. There's less of a concern in general of any chemicals being absorbed into the body. Some folks are concerned about that. And so I tell my patients, you know, if you're concerned about chemical sunscreens being absorbed in the body conceptually, physical blockers are better. In that sense, they cause less allergic reactions. Um, they function, they, they actually work better in general. So if I have patients with photosensitive eruptions, for example, if, if my patients have lupus and they have rashes from the sun, I really want physical blockers on board. But the important thing is, you know, some sunscreen is better than none. And so if you can tolerate chemical sunscreens, if you're not sensitive or allergic to the chemical sunscreen sprays or the sunscreens, or the chemical-based sunscreens, they tend to be thinner because they're smaller molecules, obviously. And so they go onto the skin easier. And so some sunscreen is better than none, right? And so if you can make it a part of your healthy habit there, you know, my favorite sunscreen is the one that my patients will tolerate and use. Right. And you know, with, with a darker skin tone like I have, um, the weight cast is also, you know, an issue with a lot of people maybe choosing not to wear sunscreen at all. Right. And there are some tinted sunscreens out there. So it can be a trial and error. And, you know, one of the fun things in clinics, sometimes we have some samples and we can, you know, try to find the right one for our patients, but it's trial and error. And it's not necessarily the most expensive sunscreen that works the best. And so it's really trying to find the one that agrees with your skin. And that's a lifelong learning process sometimes. Well, we have uh, some questions coming in. So let's get to some questions. One of the questions that have come through is I see on the internet sites that talk about harmful ingredients in sunscreen and then suggest other sunscreen options that are usually expensive. Is that true or are they unproven problems? You know, just like I answered in the last question, you know, physical blockers conceptually are safer because they're larger molecules that don't get absorbed into the body. There's newer technologies where they can come and be applied to the skin even easier. And so it's one of those things where be careful about what you read online. Um, more expensive does not necessarily mean better. Actually, there are lots of physical block sunscreens from your main, um, you know, main companies that you see in the shelves at CVS and Walmart. So it doesn't necessarily have to cost an arm and a leg. No, that's great. We have another question coming in. Um, and this probably gets to the aging um, question that probably a lot of us have. How do I know my skin is aging well or not aging well? That's, that's a tough question. So I, I think it's in the eyes of the beholder sometimes. Uh, the, the hardest conversation sometimes with my patients in clinic I think my patient's skin looks great, but they're not where they want to be, right? So it's a very individual conversation that I have with my patients. And um, the, the interesting thing is that these days there are technologies, there are treatments that can try to get you closer to where you want to be. But that's a very individual question. I don't think there's a one size fits all. And what works for somebody may not work for their other family member. And so that's a very individual conversation. So hard to give you a very definite answer there. Sure. It's interesting what you're you're talking about is basically you, you mentioned as we age, skin does change. And in some senses, our, we're not going to be 30, 30 years older um, and not see any changes. And we probably have to embrace, you know, just because you're aging doesn't mean it's a bad thing and doesn't mean that, um, you know, you're never going to look like you did maybe in your 20s, but embrace the journey of life sometimes. I, I entirely agree there. So another question that we have here is wearing sunscreen the best way to protect my skin from the sun? It's one of the two best ways. The other thing I talked about was the photoprotective, photoprotective clothes. So 
sunscreen wears out and not everyone uses sunscreen perfectly. And so that extra layer of protection from sun protective clothes can be what makes or breaks you during a long trip. You know, uh, sunscreen wears off after two hours in general, if you're outdoors in the sun. And so most of the time we're enjoying life out there and we're forgetting to get that one extra reapplication on board. And so um, the further protective clothes come in handy to, to give us another layer of protection. So you, you talked about skincare and we have a few questions here about children. So should we incorporate uh, sunscreen in our daily regimen for our kids as well? That's my learning. I'm learning that right now with my five and three year old at home. And so most of the morning is spent chasing the kids around getting sunscreen on. But I think we've gotten to a point where one of them will actually start the process themselves. And so I think if you can make it a daily habit, it's nice, but it's hard. I know in the morning when you're trying to rush out the door to get the kids to school on time, it's hard to get that layer of sun protection on. And so it's a struggle even for me. And so I think um, I have nothing against it. I'm biased in that response there because I love the sun protection. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Dow, for answering our first Q&A. Why don't we get to the second half of your presentation? You got it. Let me share the screen again. Okay. So on to the second P of um, healthy skin. So the second P stands for planning. Planning healthy nutritional habits by promoting a balanced nutritious diet with a focus on whole foods and antioxidants. So in general, antioxidants will help decrease photoaging, whereas diets high in fat and carbohydrates are associated with accelerated skin aging. So that's one thing to take note of. We already know that deficiencies in certain nutrients have been linked to various cutaneous signs. So for example, vitamin B3 deficiency results in a condition called pellagra, marked by the four Ds, dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, and if untreated, death. And so skin findings in pellagra include this photosensitive eruption, such as the Casals necklace uh, featured on the top right image, as well as dry skin dermatitis, um, as you can see in the pellagra's boot on the bottom right picture. Um, and another example here, vitamin C deficiency causes scurvy. So skin findings here in scurvy include corkscrew hairs as seen in the top right photo, as well as hemorrhage and bruising of the skin in the bottom right photo. And so we know that nutrition is really important. So question number one, do you want to decrease wrinkles and skin sagging? You know, one thought out there is that antioxidants can decrease collagen damage from free radicals. And so some common sources include tomatoes, berries, turmeric, and green tea. And so we know that advanced glycation products also will damage collagen, which can lead to wrinkling and sagging of the skin. And so these glycation products form when sugar bonds with proteins. Foods limiting the spikes in the blood sugar can help. So these include whole foods with high fiber, healthy proteins, some herbs, spices, and fruits. So how about losing skin elasticity? There's something called elastase, an enzyme triggered by UV exposure, and it degrades elastic fibers. So foods that may block elastase, or at least are associated with increased skin elasticity, include ginger, white tea, pomegranate, and monounsaturated fatty acids. And so in, in terms of skin fragility, we already talked about vitamin C and scurvy, but vitamin C plays a role in collagen synthesis and it can be found in broccoli, cauliflower, and citrus fruits. Polyphenol phytonutrients can also inhibit collagenase. And so some sources here include artichokes, celery, basil, cilantro, and parsley. Also, foods that limit UV damage can decrease photoaging. And so these include tomatoes, in green tea, amongst others. Omega-3 fatty rich foods can help reduce skin roughness and improve skin hydration. Foods such as ground flax seeds, walnuts, and various fatty fish can help. Polyphenol phytonutrients, again, in foods such as grapes and berries, for example, can help improve blood flow. And lastly, carotenoids found in carrots and sweet potatoes, for example, have been reported to impart this quote-unquote healthy glow. And so what's the bottom line here? I just toss a lot of different foods at you here, but you know, bottom line is more studies really are needed 
but we already know that a whole food diet has multiple health benefits across multiple organ systems. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in general, I tell my patients, be careful of extreme diets that oftentimes aren't sustainable. A helpful hint here and there is to try to cook with moist heat, such as steaming and poaching um, for maximal health benefits and avoiding processed or fried foods on the other hand will help as well. And so this is the picture that we want to avoid, the sodas, the pizzas, the chips. Um, and this is the picture that we're going for here, whole foods, high fiber, fruits, vegetables. Um, there's growing data, not perfect science yet um, in terms of the trials, but um, we know already um, the benefits of um, uh, whole foods um, for our health. And I think that includes the skin. And so lastly, the third P, performing an individualized skincare regimen by selecting the right products and procedures with the right team behind you. So to highlight some of my favorite recommendations, we'll discuss number one, vitamin A derivatives, as well as number two, nicotinamide, and we'll review a list of optional procedures to consider. So retinoids and retinols are vitamin A derivatives. Um, they've been widely studied and touted for their ability to reduce photoaging. So the anti-aging properties of tretinoin, which is FDA approved for acne, were observed soon after its introduction. So in part, some of these properties are due to increased turnover of the superficial layers of the skin, as well as a decrease in fine wrinkles. And so retinols are a type of retinoid available over the counter, and they can also decrease unwanted pigmentation and help smoothen the skin texture. However, caution is advised with retinols in general because there's no standard labeling requirements for retinol products. And so it may be a trial, um, a trial error when you're trying retinols over the counter. And so in this study here, tretinoin 0.05% of retinoid was used for 12 weeks and before and after photos are shown here of the skin. On the top layer of pretreatment, you can see that the thickness of that dark purple layer, the epidermis of the skin, is thinner than the bottom picture, which is after 12 weeks of treatment with tretinoin. And so the retinoid treatment was associated with um, thickening of the top layer of the skin. Um, and during the study, there was a decrease in melanin pigment. So topical retinoids may also help to decrease unwanted hyperpigmentation, as well as induce some healthier, slightly thicker skin. So what are some tips with retinoids and retinols? Um, one thing to remember, the, the, the quote clinically proven that you see in lots of uh, products over the counter only means that a product was given to consumers to try. It really doesn't mean that it was studied in clinical trials or that it was FDA approved. Any other skin conditions present may actually also necessitate a change in treatment plan. And so I have patients who had eczema and their skin is more reactive, for example. So it's important to take into account other conditions that you have to avoid excessive skin irritation and to prevent unwanted pigment changes if that were to occur. And so as the skin may be drier with treatment, using sun protection and making sure that we optimize dry skin care can uh, help uh, decrease unwanted side effects as well. And so the next thing I like to talk about for some of my patients um, with chronic sun damage, um, one option is the potential for vitamin B3 supplementation to help. So this was based off a New England Journal of Medicine study um, back in 2015. And this involved almost 400 patients uh, who had at least two skin cancers in the past five years. They were treated with 500 milligrams of nicotinamide twice a day versus placebo. And they were studied um, at the one year mark to see if uh, to see their rate of producing new pre-skin cancers, actinic keratoses, as well as new non-melanin skin cancers. And so based on the study, it really didn't do much at the six month mark um, from what you can see on the bottom uh, part of this graph here, but at the 12 month intervention mark, there was a trend here towards decreased rates of uh, skin cancers. And so the rate of non new non-melanin skin cancers was about a quarter lower, 25% lower, while the rate for actinic keratoses or pre-skin cancers was lower by about 20% as well. But all of the benefits for the most part were lost after nicotinamide was stopped. And so nicotinamide, for example, can function as an antioxidant and reduce UV-induced damage, um, but it looks like it just works while you're taking it. Now, there are other skin care procedures out there um, that can help decrease signs of skin aging. 
They range from chemical peels that can decrease unwanted pigmentation to neurotoxins that reduce unwanted wrinkle lines to a variety of lasers that target specific structures in the skin. So at the end of the day, it's important to consult with your physician to make sure that you get procedures from only those who are qualified to do so. And so that you can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation about what means most to you. Because again, it's not a one size fits all. What is important to somebody may not be important to somebody else. And so it's really about finding the right set of um, the, the right regimen and the right procedures to do. Um, and importantly, it's really optional, um, in my opinion, it's based on your individual goals and desires. And so, you know, in the last 30 minutes here, we reviewed the three P's of healthy skin. Number one, prevention of skin damage. Number two, planning healthy nutritional habits for skin health. And lastly, to work on that right regimen, which is really individualized um, with the right care team behind you. And so to keep it simple, remember the three Ps of healthy skin. And you know, in the clinic, I tell my patients I'm a positive thinker. I tell my patients that even though they have accumulated a lot of UV damage, photo damage over time, it really does mean that they were healthy enough to get outdoors and enjoy life. And so my job is to really enable my patients to continue to do that rather than being in the dermatology clinic all the time, taking care of skin cancers and other issues related to chronic sun exposure. And so I'll end with a photo of my family on a vacation and trying to be healthy and getting some yoga and um, early morning stretches on board. But thanks for listening and I'm happy to take some more questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dow, for sharing with us. There was a lot of very useful information. We have a bunch of questions coming in, but why don't we get to some of the ones that have come in from our YouTube page is what color clothes are the most protective? Oh, it, the most important part is the weave of the clothes. Mm -hmm. And so um, tightly woven clothes, for example, blue jeans, they're very photoprotective, mm -hmm. but it depends on the climate in which you're in, right? We wouldn't survive here in Southern California and the Inland Empire um, wearing jeans for too long in the summer. And so it depends on the weave of the clothing. Um, we know that dark colors will absorb more of that heat as well. And so it's really about what you can actually tolerate. We'll probably wanna wear lighter colored clothes um, in the hot sun so that we don't overheat, but it depends on the weave as well. Sure. We have another question and I've never actually heard of these. Um, they're asking about dietary sunscreens. So sunscreens as foods such as pomegranates and blueberries. Right. And so I, I've had some slides about the antioxidant type nature of some of these foods and nutrients. And so the science and the data, I think is hard. I don't think the studies are great. Um, we need a lot more studies out there to try to quantitate this. The hard part is trying to study nutrients that may prevent skin cancers 20 or 30 years from now, it's a hard study to design. And so there are some animal studies I know out there that are proving the benefits of various um, antioxidants, um, various nutrients, but it's hard to find a one size fits all type answer there. So we have another one, this is about lips. No matter how much lip balm I use in the winter, my lips still get chapped. Is there anything I can do to prevent this? I suffer from that as well, actually. So, <laughs> so I don't know how many times I licked my lips during the presentation today, but it's a common problem we get. Um, the, one of the issues that can happen after um, this lip licking uh, is actually called lip licking, right? So if your lips are dry and you lick your lips as the saliva evaporates off, it makes the skin more chapped, which causes you to lick your lips again. And so it can, it's a hard habit to actually quantify sometimes. And sometimes you're unconscious of not really realizing how many times you might lick your lips. So that's something to think about and investigate. I like thick ointments, um, sometimes just plain Vaseline to lock in the moisture of the lips. Um, I've had patients become allergic to various lip balms out there. Some of my patients are allergic to the chemical sunscreens and the chapsticks. And so a common saying I have in my clinic is all natural does not mean all safe. And so fragrances out there, um, tea tree oil, you name it. There are various things that my patients will use. And sometimes you get an allergic contact dermatitis on top of things. So, um, yeah, it, 
again, I think it's a very individual situation. You know, I, I think an evaluation with the physician is most important first. You know, is there a nutritional deficiency? Do we need to improve something in our diet? Um, is there something else going? Is there another diagnosis to consider, right? Is the scaling skin cancer? You know, so on and so forth. But once you get your right diagnosis, um, then we can kind of perfect the, the, the underlying process. Okay. We have another question that has come in. And speaking of petroleum jelly or Vaseline, do you recommend slugging? That I think um, took the internet by storm um, a little while ago. So that's a good question. That's a good, can you define slugging for me? So <laughs> slugging, from my understanding, is they actually, um, you put a lot of um, petroleum jelly on your face. It, it's just to bring, I think it's to bring out impurities and to lock things in, but it's, I think you cover um, cover yeah. your face quite a bit, thick, I think. I, I personally have never made that recommendation. I have made the recommendation to moisturize multiple times daily. I tell my patients, hey, moisturizing five times a day will work better than once a day. So you know, I'm, I'm probably somewhere in the middle here. I, I think there's probably decreasing um, returns for the investment in terms of the layers of creams and ointments that you can put on your skin. And interestingly, in the heat of summer, if we occlude the skin too much, we can induce sweat and increase skin irritation. And so in my patients with eczema, I have to be careful about using too much ointment during the summers when I could be actually recommending a safer, slightly thinner um, emollient cream. Great. Well, it sounds like, Dr. Dow, you've given us um, some very uh, interesting information and interesting, I mean, a lot of times people make sun protection or uh, anti-aging very complex. And what you're saying is kind of get back to the basis, eat, basics, eat uh, nutritious whole foods and put your sunscreen on. And those are, and you know, it sounds like so simple and we want to do all of these kind of interesting and new and you know expensive things when we're actually not doing the things that have been proven to work the most am i correct in saying that you got it okay great well thank you dr dow thank you for your time today thank you for all of the information and i want to thank you our viewer for joining us i want to share that this is our last one of uh 2022 and we would love for you to join us in 2023 we have an excellent uh lineup of speakers for you and i want to share who our january speaker is his name is dr stephen dunbar and some of you might uh, have heard about all of the data out there about the environment and the planet and how it could be affecting us. And Dr. Dunbar is actually going to talk about our ocean. So the big blue seas and our well being. And you don't want to miss that. That will be on January 26th. So again, I would like to thank each of you as the viewer for joining us this year for Wellness Live and we are looking forward to a wonderful 2023. I wanna wish you a wonderful and healthy holiday season.